Okay, so my name, as, as Felicity said, is uh, Stuart Lotherington. I'm a sales performance consultant. Um, I've been in sales for 30 years, um, obviously started at five years old. And, um, and ultimately, I work for a sales consultancy that it, it works all around the world, multicultural, multi um, situations in multi-disciplines. But we are, um, also works with the Institute of Travel Management as well, so I'm familiar with some of the issues and challenges that you're facing when it comes to van um, selling venues and things like that. So ultimately what I wanted to share with you during the course of this is a little bit about you know, how do you get better in sales. As a matter of interest, who, who's had sales training per se? And how, how long ago was that? Three years ago? You, you five months ago. What do you remember from the sales training? Who else? That's, what you said, what, what do you remember from sales training? <laughs> 11. <laughs> okay. Let's move. Well, ultimately, um, basically, uh, the company I work for, its parent company is based in Nashville and Tennessee. Um, it has a very long history. 1868 is where, um, when it started. I don't know if you know, but sales was actually born in the United States. The actual concept of selling was born in the United States. There's a bunch of immigrants go into a country and there'll be five blacksmiths turning up in one town, then there was some competition. So that whole concept was born in the United States. And um, I was lucky enough that when I first started in sales that I was told a whole process and a methodology and a, and a way to go out there and do a sales job. And I, the very first thing I was always taught was sales is not a black art. It isn't something that some people are good at and some people are bad at. In fact, all of us in the room are exceptionally good salespeople already it's just converting some of that kind of ability into doing it into other areas and arenas. And a lot of your social skills are things that actually you should be employing if you aren't already in the way you um, interact with your clients. In fact, one of the strap lines I like is sell the way people like to buy. And that's ultimately what I want to, want to talk about. But that's enough about the, me and my company. What I'd like to know is because obviously there's too many people in here and there's a diversity here. I know there's people from CEO level to sales executive, account executives in the room. There, actually, I did see from the list there's someone from Chelsea Football Club. Is, are they actually in here? Okay, that's all right. As an Arsenal fan, I was going to ban them. <laughs> um, so that's okay, they didn't turn up. They obviously heard I was. Um, but all I'd like you to do is just pick a shape, okay? Just pick a shape here, whichever one you're most drawn to. Has everyone picked a shape? Just so I can get an understanding of the audience I'm working with. Hopefully you've all done that. Who here, with a show of hands, pick the top left one? Be brave, it doesn't mean you're square, it's okay, all right? All right, so, so there's a th four of you in here. So apparently this means that those individuals in here, thank goodness we've actually got some problem solvers in the room because they like things in a box and being able to deal with the challenges there. Who here picked the top right? A few others, okay. Now apparently at an unconscious level, this means it's an arrowhead, it means you go directional, you're dynamic, you can change, you're a good person to have around, especially in the changing environments that we work in now. Who here picked the bottom left? This is often the most popular one. Okay, it means that there's no sharp edges on you. You're the nice people, people. Okay. So we've got two in the room. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and who picked the bottom right? And apparently you, the guys with the unhealthy obsession with alcohol and sex, <laughs> gives us some really good insight to the sort of room we got here, which actually uh, that happened to be the most popular one here. So th thanks. Felicity for inviting those types of people. Anyway, moving on. The industry challenges you're facing. There's some of the stuff that's going on in, in your world, okay? Um, I've worked with a number of venues. They keep saying the landscape is change, um, changing and challenging. Um, there's competition all the time on pricing. You know, there's a lot of competition, um, particularly on uniqueness of venues and how to differentiate yourself. There's competition on availability, understaffed, and poor performers within the organization. I don't know if that rings true with some of your locations, but these are the ones that seem to be highlighted an awful lot. And that's, that's challenged internally, right? But let's just think about the internal challenges around this and run our perception of our role. If we're the people that are supposed to go out there and close business and deals on, on our venues. First of all, this is how the landscape's changing. Business to business, sales, self-educated, i.e., the people that you're selling to have got a very good knowledge of your venue or what you're offering already. What percentage do you think that is? 
high or low? High. Okay, it's 68%. Now that was based on um, a global a, a survey back in 2015. Do you think that's got better or worse? <laughs> it's got better now, right? You know, so, that, so the people you're dealing with have already got a very good knowledge of what you are offering, which changes the way that you should be dealing with your prospects or your clients in here. Now here's an interesting question. How what percentage of people do you think want to talk to salespeople? Someone that knows, here is your face, <laughs> no one. <laughs> All, right. All right, I'm just going to ask the room, okay? So split it into whether it's in 25% uh, in, um, quartile. So who thinks it's less than 25% don't want, uh, want to speak to salespeople? Less than 25%. Who thinks it's 25 to 50%? Who thinks it's 50 to 75%? Who thinks it's more than that? None of you. The actual answer is 81%. Why do you think that is? It's certainly not our perception, is it? Because most of our perception is in a B2C environment when we go shopping or when people are phoning us on the phones to sell us insurance or knocking on our doors, right? Our perception isn't the actual reality of what people want. What's interesting and what I'd like to share with you over the course of this hour is why they want to talk to you and what they want to gain from talking to you. Because, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, the internet threw everything into the air and all of a sudden people got massive choice, but now they have too much choice. Now people can't make decisions anymore because there's just too much information for people to be able to cope with. What they want is a trusted advisor, someone that they think that's going to give them and point them in the right direction around that. So the first piece is understanding that for yourself. So let's just think about how, yeah? Is that only business to business or is that also dealing with private? No, that's business to business. That's specifically business to business, yeah? And that's where it comes um, challenging, all right? So let's just have a think of this. If you always think the way you've always thought, you'll always do as you've always done and you'll always get what you've always got, I'm sure. A number of you have heard that before. So if you are working in a scenario where you need to get better results, you've got to do something differently. You can't just carry on doing what you're doing. And a number of our organisations, the client organisations that we've been working with, will change any manner of things to be able to improve that. And I'm going to break that down for you into three simple areas as well. But let's just think about this. It sounds like obviously a lot of you have had sales training before, which is terrific. So there's obviously a lot of people here with um, some considerable experience. So let's just think about your experience and around from a learning point of view. First of all, we have unconscious incompetency. What's unconscious incompetency mean from a learning point of view? We don't know what we don't know, absolutely. Okay, so stage two from that is then conscious incompetency, yeah? Okay, so which is obviously where we now know that we don't know, or as I put in here, we now realise we're stupid, all right? So what's stage three? Conscious. conscious competency, correct, okay? So conscious competency is when we're thinking things through, you know, you could actually think about it from learning to drive and actually having to pass your driving test, you know, that, that kind of scenario where we're actually having to have that process in our head to be able to get these things um, working for us. And therefore, stage four is un unconscious competency, yeah? So unconscious competency when it's just natural, habit forming, all right? So ultimately, if we look at all these four stages, okay, and you go through this one and think of driving as an analogy that we now learn to drive and I'm sure many of you are competent drivers and have been driving for many years. What other habits do we pick up in our driving? Bad habits. Now I was recently invited by Kent County Council to a driver awareness course. <laughs> Surely I'm not the only one, maybe not Kent, but who, who's been on one of those courses? Please not make it me the... I, don't tell me I'm the only one. The old middle class bloke that uh, picked on. Um, <laughs> evidently. Well, you know, it's interesting when you go on those courses to get you to correct, because I've went three miles over the limit and therefore I'm really bad, okay? Bad habits. We all pick up bad habits. If you can recognise that when it comes to your driving, is it feasible that happens to your 
sales capability. Absolutely. It's human nature to try and take shortcuts to make things easier for ourselves. Now, I've been in sales for 30 years and I'm using the same principles now when I sell and I'm still actively going out there, winning business, managing accounts and delivering business. I'm using the same practices now that I learned when I first started on January 3rd, 3rd 1988. But so, if I want to make sure I don't pick up bad habits, what should I do? Because if I carry on picking up bad habits, where would I end up? If I carried on picking up bad habits, I would end up where? Back in number one. Back in number one. Now, are you likely to go, oh my goodness, I must be turning into someone who's unconsciously incompetent, which therefore means by definition you wouldn't do, What's actually going to happen is you're going to come up with excuses as to why you're not doing so well. The competition has increased. The pricing's not right. We're not delivering the right quality to our clients anymore. No one picks up the phone anymore. No one answers me anymore. Only people work on emails. All of these rationalizations start happening. In fact, what we say in SBR, we call them rational lies. You start coming up with plausible sounding excuses. So I admire all of you to make the commitment to come along today because ultimately you are all the good people that know really what we need to do is jump into stage three on a regular basis and that's what I'm here to do today. So how do we create successful sales habits? Well this is the three areas I wanted to talk to you about and, the, the, and, and I'm going to touch upon them lightly but ultimately I was lucky enough to be introduced to these three areas when I first started. The names are slightly different over the years, but the fundamental premise is the same. And the first thing is skills. So if you're wanting to improve your team or yourself, the first area to think of is actual sales skills. Now when you think of a sales skill, in fact, there's the first exercise. What I'd like you to do as an exercise is write down three or four what you consider to be sales skills. Okay under the skills banner of that. Now obviously being professional and highly accomplished you probably rattled them off and said Stuart I've got 15 here. What was one of the sales skills you wrote down? <laughs> Blank. <laughs> uh, I wrote persuasive. Persuasive or negotiation skills, yeah? Or, or influencing skills. It could fall into either one of those camps in there. What did you? Confidence. Confidence is probably, we would put that under a mindset, but ultimately definitely need confidence around that. What was one of the ones you put? Knowledgeable. Knowledgeable, yeah, absolutely. Market knowledge and obviously your product knowledge. What's another one that you wrote down? Knowledge and confidence. <laughs> <laughs> what was another one? Any others? People skills. So your communication skills, your ability to relate to different people in there. Did you have one another one? Uh, mirroring. Mirroring, yeah, absolutely. All part of effective communication. Okay, so the, th the thing is around skills would be how to open up a meeting, how to conduct a meeting, how to network, how to use third-person validation, answering ob objections, negotiation skills we talked about already, but then there's things like um, creating buying atmosphere, how to prevent, um, present effectively. Then there's follow-up, closing. I'm sure you all have written that down somewhere, but uh, these are all the kind of key skills. So there's an element around that. So the key things around communication is effective phone, Effective face-to-face, -face, effective written, and now it's considered to be a fourth way of communication, which is your ability to be on social media, which I'm sure some of you are highly qualified for. But the social media element is a key component to it, and it's a different type of communication. So it's now deemed as a fourth way of communicating. Now, in addition to that, we also have motivation. So we just talked about sort of um, tenacity or mindset, but under here, sorry you can't see it, but it says here, sales motivation. Now, as a generalisation, there's no such thing as an unmotivated person, but there are unmotivated salespeople. And it's just thinking around the fact that sales, quite often for some people, has a kind of a negative connotation. If I was to go out to Hoxton right now and stop someone, the first person in the street, and say, what do you think of salespeople? You're laughing. Did any positive adjectives come into mind? What were the words that came to mind? Pushy. Yeah, and pushy comes up as, a, as a, you know, a large one. When it comes to profession, a profession that would be deemed as sales, what comes to mind? 
Stay estate agent, yeah, and car, new, used car salesman, all those ones come to mind. All these kind of pictures they have in our mind. And so when we use the word sales, and that's why in some organisations they change the name, don't they? Client acquisitions, business development. My favourite, one of my clients is, is Sir Robert McAlpine, and they have a, the whole division, the work winning division, is actually called the head of pre, the guy is head of pre-construction. Do you like that? That's one of my favourite. Head of pre-construction. Anything to do to avoid the word sales. But there's nothing wrong with sales. In fact, sales should be part of your entire business. It's not just something that's re um, related to the business development person. It should be the whole business. This morning I had a meeting with a, um, within the legal community and ultimately they're saying, well, we'll hire people out there to go to business development. Yet it's the, it's the partners that have the best capability to be able to go out there and win new business. Everybody should be involved if they're involved with clients, they're involved with selling in some way, shape or form. So the mindset. So when it comes to motivation, you should have the right goals and the focus and the tenacity to go out and do the job. And the other one, which is the two, the two areas that are really important today, the, the darker areas, the skills and the systems. And we see massive improvement in performance around systems. Now when the, when the stock market had an, an issue in 2008, 2009, and everybody rationalised their business, and then with the advent of computer technology, what actually happened is that we can now do everything. We could do everything from our computer. And that has had some dramatic negative impact on us as salespeople. And I'll explain that shortly in a minute. So we've got our systems. Now when it comes to systems, we should also be thinking about what's our MI, what's our data. Quite often we, we, we have an... an, an sort of a negativity towards KPI or figures and the term micromanagement comes up. Forget what the leadership team want. You as an individual should be tracking exactly what you're doing because that helps you with the bottom one on the mindset. Because I don't know about you, but who here likes to use a things to do list? Things to do, a lot of us, right? I don't know about you, have you written down your things to do list? You then look at it at the end of the day and go, oh my goodness, I've not covered anything on this things to do list. What have I done today? Write something down, then cross it out to make you feel better. <laughs> have you done that? Yeah. Right. So when it thinks to think, when you think about the fact that actually I know I want to do, I know I need to pick up the phone, I know I need to write a proposal, I know I need to go out and see clients. You want to, but when it comes to the end of the day, you haven't. But then you say, my, my job's tough. Because it's the other stuff that gets in the way. So tracking is vitally important from a personal point of view. It's got nothing to do with the leadership. You should track what you do. How many people you reach out to, how many meetings you have, exactly on an individual basis. I still do this 30 years later, and I do it with some very simple um, management information, really easily. So that's under systems. And all of this needs to be built into our habit, our daily, our daily routine. The reason why I ask some of you if you've been on to course, uh, sales courses and things is because invariably you go on a course, it's great, just like this one, you go, fantastic, some great takeaways, but how long does it take to form a habit? It's, it's, I mean, I've just finished a psychology degree and there's huge differences around um, where the habit forming. But the person we take is a psychologist called Maxwell Maltz and he discovered that it takes roughly, for somebody who might have lost an arm in an industry accident, for them to rewire their neural pathway on average 21 days. And that's for daily use. So when you go and try something, do you really give yourself a chance to make it work? Now, I'll demonstrate the fact that also with habits, we also quite often, one of the biggest ways we learn is called social learning. And just to demonstrate the social learning, we do what everyone else does. Let me just look at this, for example. Now, how do you open up one of these? Most people say top and referring to this bit, but they grow this way, so, but you mean the stalky bit, right? And you need to get a banana nearly like this that's kind of a snappable window, isn't it? And a snappable window is roughly about a day, because after that, when you try and snap it, what happens? Mushes. It goes mush. Mush works, that word works internationally, mush, right? But who are the experts of banana opening? Monkeys. Do you ever see them go, I'll just snap it here? <laughs> no. They open it from the easy end. They open it from the easy end, all they need to do is pinch and it's already open and then you peel it back and you'll have a perfectly open banana no matter what the condition of the inside of the banana is every single time. Wow. <laughs> Who's gone, that's me done, I'm going to the bar now. 
What I'm getting at, just to demonstrate that, is that so many people sell incorrectly. Now I had somebody, she actually has now become a personal trainer and she's a personal trainer at my gym and, and you're saying you don't go to the gym, you're right, I haven't been for ages. But anyway, at, my, at the gym and I said, she used to work for French Connection, okay, so it's a prestigious, prestigious brand and all the rest of it and, and I've got four daughters so I'm familiar with all this sort of stuff, I hadn't, you know, not um, through wanting to, but anyway. Um, and I said, how much training did you get in French Connection? Guess what she said? None. None. So it's no wonder that when someone comes up to us, they always say those immortal words, can I help you? It's a little bit like us on the phone, when we phone somebody on a cold call and you say, hi, how are you doing, how's your day? When someone phones you that you don't know that says, hi, how are you doing, how's your day, who is it going to be on the end of the phone? A salesperson, guaranteed. Don't do it. Oh God, sorry. <laughs> Don't do it. All right. It's a, sorry. I got a bit passionate about that bit, didn't I? Okay. So, twenty-one days to form a habit, right? And, and so, Maxwell Maltz talks. Uh, sorry, um, Albert Gray talks about the common denominator of success. And if you wanted some reference material for helping you in the mindset, he wrote a great speech in the 1940s to a bunch of insurance sales men. I'm afraid it was just men in those days, but it's still worth a read. Okay. And he says the common denominator of success is forming the habits of doing the things unsuccessful people don't like to do. And there is a plethora of really good insight, and you can Google the entire speech and download that. It's great reading. But let's move on, okay? Let's think about it. On average, salespeople just spend, what percentage do you think they spend on their time selling to customers? So ask yourself the question, what percentage? 5%. Would you all agree with that? Not me. 80%. Right. Ten, ten, no, I'm, I'm just saying that, I'm pretending it's not me. All right, so 10% is what they actually do. What people perceive they do is 20%. What I'm getting at is because we can do everything now online, there's, there is so much stuff we take on board on the admin side and everything else where we made massive gains in organizations, just purely not training anything with sales techniques, is just increasing the time they put in front of people. Increasing that time. So if there's any way that you can diminish the amount of activity, because invariably most salespeople are doing the activity of someone that should be paid half the amount that they are, if not a quarter of the amount that they are. And it's also really good succession planning because if you get people in at that level that are learning what you're doing but taking all the administration away. Now in one consultancy work with um, recently, they have doubled their turnover just by doing that, by having someone take away the administrative part or parts of the administrative part of their role. Stop putting your hand up and doing it and challenge yourselves and your organisation around could somebody else be doing this so I could spend more time in people? Now, when you think about it, that's probably what most of you would prefer to be doing anyway. Right? So that's what we want to make sure we do. Now, here's the thing, okay? Six Sigma just talks about the fact that you just need to analyse. I won't go into it too much, but let's just think about it. Do you work out what you need to work on? So, fundamentally, do you take your target and what do you do with your target on a quarterly or an annual basis to work out what you need to do? Now, I don't want to teach you to suck eggs, but this is kind of the basic elements around this. What you do is you divide your average order value up to work out what you need to do as far as wins are concerned. Then what do you do? You then work out, well, actually, with that ratio of 5 to 1 is that I need to now go and get my proposals, and if it's 5 to 1, I now need to make sure I have 25 proposals in that period of time going out. And you reverse engineer your targets around this, and you have, I mean, some of you use the term walk-arounds, it might be actual face-to-face -face meetings. You know, you work out exactly by doing this around for your business. Now, the first exercise is for you to actually just either do it for one and just think about if one sale, what would this gut feel be for me? Or you could do it for this, as it has demonstrated here, one that scenario. So just take a minute to think, actually, and this is the most simplest one, what would be my ratios going from the bottom to proposals to meetings 
to conversations and it reaches. Now, some of you might have a dual role of account management and new business, and of course it's going to be different, so you might want to do two. But if you have a, I do both, and I just still put it into one pot. I'll give you two minutes to write out something that's going to be, you know, just as a gut feel, what do you think your data would be if you don't already know it? Okay. <coughs> All right, so if, the, if it didn't complete the exercise, it's something that I would say, and if you don't know, then start capturing the data. Start capturing your data. Start working out. Whenever I have a black spot, and it does happen, whenever I think it's like really, really tough, I count, <coughs> excuse me, I count how many people I reach out to on a daily basis. It took me several years in consulting. I've been a consultant for 13 years now. To when I first started, I didn't have any contacts. I had a blank book. So I came to events like this. I went out there and networked. I started getting names together. I started reaching out to people, and I started formulating my LinkedIn elements on that. Now, LinkedIn, obviously, is a key driver, and I'm sure all of you are on there. And the business activity you should be putting on your LinkedIn, by all means link in with me and, and, and see what I post and think actually that might be an idea I should be doing the same. I'd be very happy for any of you to link in with me and use it as a, an, escape, uh, an idea of, oh, actually, that's, that I, I need to post that this is going in here. We've just delivered this for this client. Oh, this is a really interesting client. Really excited about this. You won't believe who's just turned up at our venue. All of that sort of stuff is what your clients need to see to reinforce and get that happening is on your LinkedIn. Now, it's taken me a few years, but I've got 3,500 contacts on LinkedIn. And you have lots of people that, in a similar sort of vein that you should be, on a regular basis, having those as contacts in there. Why wouldn't they, once they've already worked with you, link in with you to keep up to date with what's going on? Now, here's the thing for a source for you. Because 20% of your LinkedIn changes jobs every year. That statistic has been consistent for at least 10 years. So then when they move, and it alerts you when they move, you've got another lead, another location, someone else to go and talk to about potentially going with you, and if they enjoyed it. Also, when you're working with somebody, who's the replacement for that individual if you haven't already got that connection in there? You probably already know all of these sort of things here. So for me personally, I know that if on a day-to-day -day basis, I can reach out to people no matter what. If I was with you guys all day long, coming into the office, going out of the office, I could still reach out to people through LinkedIn, through an email, if I can't actually call them. I know that benchmark works for me because I have a benchmark of a minimum of 10 meetings while I'm doing this on a, uh, on a, on a monthly basis. I know our industries are very different, but whatever your number is, I, I maintain that number. In fact, so far this year, it's been on average 16. So I'm 60% above my minimum criteria, as, as, which is very indicative of the way our work is going at the moment. But it, that is, I know that I'm going to be safe. Now, if I know that I'm going to have meetings and they're going to deliver, what do you think my mindset is when I go to a meeting? Very relaxed, absolutely. I, there's no pressure on my clients. If they want to work with me, that's great. If they don't, that's also great. So mindset-wise, knowing that actually I'll play the numbers is the way that it helps me relax around what I'm doing. So when it comes to it, what does this actually mean? Well, if you carry on with going through something like this, you could actually work out how much each um, inquiry costs is worth to the business. One engineering firm I was working with, they worked out when the phone rang, it was worth £1,000. Changed the entire mindset of the organisation. When the phone rang, it was worth £1,000. How much does the phone worth when it rings, or how much is an email worth when it comes in to your business? The whole team should know that, because it changed their mindset around the urgency of how much that, that could be worth. And that will go up by that very activity alone. When you have a meeting, when you have a walk around, you can work out how that happens. Now, when I first started in sales, I was knocking on doors. Yeah, I was one of those people. But my manager, in my very first year, said to her, in fact, after my first month, said, how much money do you want to work? Do you want to earn? And I was being super cheeky and turned around and said, 500 pounds, which in those days was a lot of money. No way in a million years did I think that was actually going to happen. He goes, right, and he went through my data. And he said, all you had to do is knock on, one door is equal to one pound, whether they answer the door or not. How does that work for your psyche? 
I'm sure none of you like to pick up cold calling or do the phoning, but if you knew that each time you dialed somebody, just the dial itself was worth 50 quid, does that help? It might do. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm getting at with the funnel though, is sales is not a numbers game, it's a ratios game. It's working out what are your conversion rates. And if you've got a team of people, you'll probably have different conversion rates, which means you've got expertise in different parts in your team. Most of the time I spend when I work with my clients is go and pick out on the good people in different parts and work out what is it they're doing that's so good that seems to give them high conversion rates over other people. And we pick out all that best practice. You've probably got it in your business. But let's have a look at meetings. This was a survey done globally against all sorts of people in a procurement space around actually when someone goes to a meeting, what actually happens? Knowledge about the company. Does the person that's seeing them have knowledge about their company and products? 76%, sorry, 78% said yes, they have knowledge about product services. But 21% said no, they don't. They don't have knowledge about the people they're in meetings with. Knowledge about my industry. 77% said yes, 22% said no. Prepared for the questions. Now these are the good responses, but it's amazing that nearly a quarter of salespeople don't have the right answers for these questions here. But one of the things I'm going down here can relate to my role and responsibilities in the organisation. 70% said yes, 30% said no, and then it changes here. Understands my issues and where they can help. Only very roughly 50-50. Understanding your client issues is where you really add value. If you truly understand that, which is a very simple thing to go and do, has relevant examples and case studies, 37% said yes, 62% said no, they don't have relevant case studies. People want to know others, just like them, with the same issues, challenges, what did they do under these circumstances? You should have a plethora of third-person validation. Very quickly, let's just go through the buying cycle of when people are in there. So if you're reaching out to people, there's a very good chance you're going to reach out to people in their satisfied state. They are okay, nothing to worry about. I'm all right right now. But what salespeople do because they feel they have to do a sales job is they still present a solution. Let me, let me tell you, especially if you've got a good relationship with them. They're a good relationship with them. No, I'm sorry, I just thought I'd phone you. We've, got, well, we've opened up a new wing right now. I'd just like to tell you about it. And they go, okay. Have you, have you ever got them feeling that? All right. It's only because you're buying the beer. Yeah? Don't pitch in satisfaction. What you want to do is you want to create realisation. You create realisation by asking questions. All right? Failure to investigate the customer's need. I spent nearly two years of my career as a, in B2B sales because people thought it was nice to have our services. They didn't need to have their services. It's nice to work in, and, and use your venues. They don't necessarily need to use them over someone else's. So you've got to create realisation. So the correct behaviour is understanding the consequences if they don't work with you, if they do go somewhere else. They don't have the reliable service that you provide, the, the agreeable payment terms, the amount of staff that you have on to help them make sure it works and works smoothly, whatever your unique value proposition is around that. The assessment phase, which is where most salespeople go in, is that's when most of your clients will make an inbound inquiry, the assessment phase. What percentage of them already know about you and have already understood your business? 68%. And the other thing is, is, do you think they're just calling you? No. So this is when you're up, and this is when it becomes a beauty parade. Now, it's a really interesting um, statistic that if you help clients go from here to here, improves your sales success by 68%. I mentioned McAlpine as an example. I went to McAlpine in the satisfied state. It took me a year to go down into this situation here. And when they write out an RFP and sent it out to the market, guess who actually helped them write the RFP? All right, the request for proposal was outlined by something we'd already sent them. Funnily enough, we won. If it goes to that scenario, quite often people have already made up their minds. So you need to be smarter and more agile around working with the people that actually don't need your services right now, but potentially could if you want to be building longer term relationships. And then of course, we go in a scenario where they make a decision, 
quite often the mistake is that people have that buyer's remorse or something else crops up because you think you've nailed it and signed it off and don't just give them that last bit of reassurance that you're looking forward to working with them or them using your location, all right? And then, of course, the delivery. And that's when you go and get the opportunity to get the referrals and start moving on and getting the other networking elements around what you want to do to secure the relationship going further forward. So here's a couple of things for you. Do you have a clearly defined sales process in your business? <coughs> Hands up who does. A sales process. Okay. That's, need some help there. I'll give you my business cards later. Right? <laughs> you need to have a sales process. And it's as simple as the one I shared with you before, you know. What happens when an inquiry comes in? If you are responsible for recruiting salespeople, what you've basically fundamentally told me is that they've got to wing it and learn from what you're doing. You're not telling them exactly what they should be doing. What is the process of dealing with an inbound inquiry? What is the process of going reaching out to people? What is the process of networking? What do you do with that particular lead or that contact? What is the process that then happens with that lead or that contact? And what is the step-by-step? The step? We're working in a digital and a data-driven world now. This is how we need to go if you want to escalate your business. The other thing is, is do you have a common uh, communicated sales methodology? Is there a sales process of how you interact with people? Who here has got a sales process, a sales methodology in their business? Well, it's a good job I'm here, I'm going to give you one. Phew. All right. And then, do you know um, who your buyers are? Do you have sales personas on buyers? So some of our most successful clients are the ones that actually will say a stressed Sally or a procurement Pete. Just for those two names, you could probably understand that there'll be a pressurised individual that needs to find somewhere quickly over someone that's going to be more diligent. Requires different sales capability on how to sell to them. If you give them those personality types. Okay? So, here's your sales process for you. Super simple. We call it quiz with an S. What, you should, what should you do when you interact with people at the beginning? Question. Question. All right. This is how technical it is. Okay. So that you can understand, then you influence and solidify. Now, I have studied Dipita, Aida, Aid, Kerr, Panda, Miller Hyman, whiteboard selling, and a plethora of others. They're all fundamentally the same, which saves you having to go and buy a book on them. I'm going to tell you it now. Three simple words when it comes to um, client interaction. What do you, who do you think the Q and the U is all about? Customer. The customer. So it's all about them. So the first part is all about your client or your prospect. What do you think the I is about? It's all about? Us. Yeah, it's selling to their needs. Absolutely. It's all about us. How we get our proposition to uh, um, align with what their needs are. And what do you think the solidify is all about? Who's that all about? Both. So it's simple. Them, us, we. When you have had sales interactions that you don't like, the main reason why is because they do which bit first? The influence first. You don't like that. So I'm assuming that you don't sell like that. Even when the client goes, right, I've seen your venue, I've seen it, I've seen it, I looked on the, on the website or whatever it is, um, can you tell me how much it costs? Have you had those kind of calls? And what do you do? Um, clients ask me. I better tell them. Yeah? Don't tell them straight away. You need to ask questions. Absolutely, of course I can tell you how much it costs. Tell me, what's it, what's it all about? What's it for? When is it? Start qualifying that individual. Start understanding what their needs are. Because your expertise and your experience is really shown in the quality of your questioning. You will differentiate yourself from your competitors by the quality of the questions you ask. Because then they go, this person sounds competent. They know what they're talking about. They've asked me questions I haven't even thought about. I didn't even think around all the extra services that I need which is going to make this the best annual award ceremony the company's ever had, and I'm responsible for that, I'm going to be made a look a hero. Because, you're, because of your job. And then they can compellingly to ask for more budget if they need it, because I'm sure you're all the expensive venues. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've sold it to them in the right way. 
Here's how you do it. If you think about it, future, past. What do you think the salesperson's focus is? Past, present or future? Future, absolutely. What do you think the, uh, um, the client's focus is on? It's on the present. Yeah, what the present, what it, what, where they are right now. And to be able to get an accurate picture, you need to go back before you can go forward. So most salespeople go forward. What the client wants is for you to go and understand them. So salespeople go and do this. They go straight into, let me tell you what you can have with us. We're fabulous. Like they'd never heard that before. Some might ask one or two questions and then go for the kill. But a quality salesperson is someone that's going to go and question so they can truly understand and then get, truly under, get the client to understand what their major issues are and then circle back. And this is how you sell at a better value because your value gap is better than other people's. That's the role that you need to be doing. Now, Stephen Covey, I don't know if you've heard of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If there's a book I would recommend anyone to read, and if you're not a big reader, because it actually is a big book, then it's on Audible. So Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is the number one bestseller and has been long after. He passed away in 2012. Okay, it's still on the Amazon bestseller list and as, as personal development books. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of his seven habits is seek first to understand and then be understood. Might actually be good for some relationship counselling as well. Right. <laughs> now, stop that. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> okay, so what is your questioning process? Well, again, Stephen Coe said this, most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. It feels, they know people a little bit like that. They're just waiting to put in their bit rather than listen to what's going on. That's quite often us in a sales role. What happens is someone says something and we go, right, that's it, and you go straight in without still following up the understanding. And it's that extra understanding that's going to reassure the client that what they're going to get is going to be suitable for their needs. So when you hear that sales need and they actually have said, right, this looks like the right venue, ask what is it particularly they like about it so that you can reassure them, even in the yes scenario. And if it's in a, well, we're just looking for at the moment, so what's important to you? One of the things I find salespeople, ridiculous they don't ask this, what's your criteria? How are you judging one venue from another? What's the important factors before you're judging one venue to another? I, I, I know what I'm saying is, can you tell me how to sell to you? But it's amazing how people don't realise that's what I'm asking. Because all I'm saying is, how are you differentiating one from another? What have you liked from other venues? Why are you not using them? What did you not like from other venues? And then, of course, it's given you your entire script. Right? So, questioning. Okay? Open questions, closed questions, all that sort of stuff. You know all those. What's an open question? Yeah. So ask me any open question you like. You, you were good at it, so. I oh, know, sorry, the chat behind you. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Four. Actually, I haven't, that was my children. I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> one. But that was a. It's a closed question. Close question, all right? Tell me how you feel about your children. Okay. Right, now I'm being pedantic, I just want to demonstrate the fact that have you ever had scenarios when you get someone to ask open questions and they give you a closed answer? Have you had that? There are certain personality types that fall into that criteria, I'm not going to go into that today, but they definitely give you closed answers, right? So how do you deal with that? Because what happens is you end up going question, answer, question, answer, in fact you're not thinking about their answer because you're trying to think of the next question, right? And then you give up, and so what do you do when you give up asking questions because you're not getting much from them? You go, let me tell you about our place then. <laughs> right? You go straight into presentation mode. So I'm going to give you a, a way to open up a meeting. Okay? Now if you open up a meeting and tell them exactly the, the reason for the meeting, the purpose, the agenda, clarify the time, and making sure everyone's on the same page, how long does that roughly take? I'm going to show you how to do it in 37 seconds. All right. If you want to record this, because we haven't got time to write it down, I'm going to 
show you how to do it in 37 seconds. This will work for you, guaranteed. Okay. So, this is what we want to go and do. I don't know if anyone wants to time me. This is a, I always get a, a nice look. 37 seconds, here we go, all right. So, um, let's imagine I'm going to go in there from SBR Consulting. What, what's your name? Phoebe. Phoebe, all right. So, I'm going to go Phoebe. You only have to say yes at the appropriate time, Phoebe, okay? So, here we go. So, Phoebe, thanks for agreeing to see me today. We're obviously here to talk about SBR Consulting and how we may be able to help and, and support your business going further forward. Um, obviously, I've brought some ideas that may or may not be a fit for your business, and I know we've allocated an hour for today's, um, for today's meeting. Is that still okay? Yes. Brilliant. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm not too familiar with your current situation. Having done the research, I've brought some ideas. But before I dive into those, what will be helpful is to understand a little bit about my you, some of the challenges you're facing, what you're particularly looking for, and anything else you think will help me understand your current situation. Is that close? 29. I was nervous. Phoebe made me nervous. <laughs> All right. Um, what did I do? Thanks for the time. Agreed that it was about an hour. Said that we we're obviously here to talk about our organisation, how we can help. Didn't tell her, I don't know anything about you. Tell me. Done, done some research. Had a quick look. Brought some ideas that may be of use. That's important language. And then you use the word but. You know the times when you use the word but? What it means is ignore everything else I've just said before it. But before I do that, what would be really helpful is, and I used a cluster question. It was three or four questions in one sentence. Which, which question do you think Phoebe's going to answer? The last one, or anything else, is often the most... Um, is, is often the most common one, you're right. But actually, it's the one that's the most important to Phoebe. It's all land on you, Phoebe. All right, it's going to be the one that's most important to her. So it's called a cluster question. Because the brain acts as a filter, it will hear the question it relates to most. But when you come up there and say, and ask a specific question, that they're not ready, you'll get a closed answer. If you fire three or four questions in that cluster right at the beginning, at the beginning of the meeting, that's the only time you'd use a cluster question. And what you want to do then is then to pass the talking baton. Pass it over to them to get them to open up. How better do you feel when the prospect or client starts to talking? It relaxes everybody rather than you having to feel I've got to go into pitch mode. So do you have a qualification process around this? And I'm sure you all do. And there's probably the simple qualification around how big is it, what, how many people, and all those kind of things. But the more important qualification process in your, in your world would be the differentiators. What is special about this particular event? What have you been to before? What have you liked? What have you not liked before? So you, you can alter and actually qualify in or qualify out individuals in there. So what, and here's, the, breaking it down for you, what's their objectives, what's important to them? And here's the final one, which we use as taboo. Some of you may have come from your sales training, um, heard of the word BANT. Who's heard of the word BANT? Okay, I'm going to question some of this sales training, right? Okay, but BANT is the most common one, but we don't like BANT. And I'll tell you, I won't even tell you what it is. I don't want you even to write it down, right? So taboo is the right one, okay? Taboo starts with, well, what are the timelines you're working with? Because this is all going to help you with your qualification. The A stands for, what do you think about when qualification? What's the A? Uh, that's a good one. That comes up in there. But it's the authority. Who's going to sign off on this? Who's the kind of decision makers in there? Then you ask budget. And then the um, one that's often forgotten is that it's O, which stands for obstacles. What's going to get in our way to making this a successful engagement? What could get in the way? So it's, uh, what are the obstacles we need to overcome to make sure this works as smoothly as possible? And they might tell you, we need to sell this to someone else. We might need to go some, and do this with somebody else. Um, other than in there. So a couple of other tips. We've got time for some tips. I'm just going to go into buying versus selling, first of all. I'm, I'm going to park this one. Buying versus selling. Buying atmosphere. The best way to describe buying atmosphere is to describe selling atmosphere. Selling atmosphere is exactly what happens to all of you when you walk into a shop. Someone comes up to you and says, can I help you? What do you all say back? No. 
You would think retail have worked this out, that they should stop asking that question. But they don't, because they're all still opening the barn the wrong way, right? So, it's when, why do we respond that way? We feel uncomfortable when we feel under pressure. So what do you do back? You push back. Do you do that to your clients? Pretty much most of the companies that we work with, and maybe you're the exception, create pressure on their clients. They don't create pull by creating a buying atmosphere. Buying atmosphere is created through two ways. One, physicality, my seating position, but more importantly, it's in the language I use in my emails and in my face-to-face -face or phone interactions. If I say you should do this, is that buying or selling? Selling. The selling. If I say you might like to consider this, that's buying. Let me tell you how this works with you if you work with us. If I tell you something, is it buying or selling? Telling is push, I'm telling you to do something. But if I say, is it okay if I share with you, totally different picture. You think you have the same picture in your head, but it lands in a very different way. Communication is not what comes out of your mouth, it's what goes in their head. So fundamentally, you want to think about it. And for you to learn this, because you've probably already got the concept, it's that simple, is record yourself. Record yourself in a client interaction. Put yourself on record mode, stick the phone in your pocket, we all leave them on the table there, and then listen to what you say in a meeting. If you've never done that, that is a huge leap. It's horrible, your voice sounds horrible. I thought I had a really dark, dusky, you know, chocolatey voice, and then I know it's not like that, I'm sorry. But that's what I've been perfecting and thought I had. That will be the first realisation. The second realisation is you say so many words you probably shouldn't do. Massive learn by recording yourself around that one. So, third person validation, that's one way to also create buying atmosphere. I mentioned third person earlier, and that's the other part around it all, and I would turn around and say, this is the biggest area. If you were to go to the pub and just say, do you want to go to the pub? You may get a response, but if you said to your friend, I'm going to the pub with Bob, Bill, Jane, Jane and Jeremy, what do you think your chances are of improvement of being able to get more people coming to the pub? The first one or the second one? Some people say, well, they'll all definitely come with me. <laughs> all right, but the second one, right? So why don't we, we do that socially? Why are we not doing it in our business environment? Why are we not mentioning, oh, yeah, it's great you caught up. In fact, yeah, we've just had Hitachi come over in here. They had a lovely conference in this sort of situation. We're working with Sony at the moment. They want to do something quite unique. You bring it into your language. Now, you don't just name drop the big ones, because as soon as you do the big names, then everyone goes, oh, it's not what? It's not relevant. So you want to make sure there's relevance, and the relevance can fit in any one of these ways. Whether it's the size, the geography, the industry, individuals, job titles. And there are different ways. So you have golden names, which is the big names, and then you have the relevant names. And we use the word 3D here. When we say 3D, what we're talking about is bring it to life. Don't just name drop. I was just been talking to Jill. She is under a lot of pressure to make sure that the conference that she's putting together is really wow. Okay, and they've used some very um, impressive venues in there. So we were really pleased when she chose us. And the reason for that was, that's what we're talking about. And all these things are slight edges. And all I'm saying is on the habits triangle, think of slight edges. And 0.2% improvement on a daily basis would improve you by 100% in a year. So just think of the continued improvement. Okay. Thank you, Thanks very much. Thank you, Cheers, everyone.